Welcome to Arca Treats Food for Thought, sponsored by Friends of the Alabama Archives. We're so glad to see you today. We hope that you'll visit our Friends gift shop. Uh, we do have books about the year of Alabama history, including some of our speakers' books that are there today, if you'd like to purchase one and have him sign it after the program. Uh, we'd also invite you to plan to join us next month as we continue the programs of celebrating the Year of Alabama History. On Thursday, September the 17th, Leah Rawls Atkins will present Shaking the Foundations, Alabama in the 1930s and 40s. If you have missed any of our Architreats programs, be sure to go to the Archives website and click on Multimedia. There you can find a streaming video of our past Architreats programs, and you probably have received a postcard that has listings of our Architreats programs on the back. You can go to Alabama Public Television's website, APT Plus, under Education, and they have also uh, the presentations on their website and are preparing lesson plans for teachers to use this in their classrooms. Today's program is made possible by a grant from the Alabama Humanities Foundation and inside your program that you received today, you should find a green sheet. This is an evaluation form. Please complete this before you leave today and turn it into one of our volunteers. This will help us with granting in the future so that we can continue having programs like this for you to enjoy. Please remember to turn off or silence your cell phones before we begin the program. Thank you. Today's speaker was born in York, Alabama. He graduated from Sumter County High School and earned degrees from Livingston University, the University of Alabama School of Law, the University of Alabama in Birmingham, UAB, and the University of Arkansas. A few of his many positions that he has served include Assistant State Attorney General and lobbyist for the University of South Alabama. For the last 21 years, he has taught history at UAB. He is author of Two Party Politics in the One Party South and a, a co-editor of Alabama's Governors, A Political History of the State, which are both available in the Friends Gift Shop. Recently retired from UAB, and he's just returned from a trip to Europe. Please welcome Sam Whale. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I feel a little bit like in discussing 1874 to 1929, like uh, uh, the journalist and TV personality Alistair Cook when he told somebody he was going to do a program for public television on all of American history. And he was going to try to do it in 13 hours. And he said this guy who was a southerner looked at him and said, you better talk fast, boy. <laughs> so I'm going to have to do a very similar thing, I think. I'm going to divide this uh, presentation really into four parts. Uh, we're talking almost exclusively about politics. Uh, and uh, these four parts are, first of all, bourbonism. Uh, which really deals with the period of the late uh, 19th century after Reconstruction. Populism, uh, which came in the 1890s. Uh, and then progressivism uh, in, the, in the period of 1900 and 1920. Uh, really, uh, we'll be talking about struggles between progressives and conservatives. And then the politics of the 1920s, when the Ku Klux Klan emerges as a, a major player uh, in Alabama politics. Uh, before we move on to bourbonism in the late uh, 19th century, however, I think we ought to, first of all, to dispose of Reconstruction. Let's talk a little bit about Reconstruction, and then we can talk about who the bourbons were, these politicians who took over Alabama in the post-Reconstruction period. Uh, there's a sort of tragic legend of Reconstruction that Southerners, I think, carry in their DNA. And it sort of goes this way. Uh, when the Civil War was over, uneducated and incompetent former slaves, as people believed, went into the Republican Party with a small group of disreputable and contemptible whites called scalawags, and a set of money-grubbing carpetbaggers from up north who swarmed across the South like a horde of locusts. 
Supported by radical Republicans in Congress, this black and tan coalition seized control of state and local governments in the southern states. Their leaders were either unqualified for office or corrupt, and they adopted ruinous public policies and bankrupted the states. Down at the county and city level, black and white Republicans committed unspeakable injustices against white Democrats. Thus, the majority of whites had to do whatever was necessary to retake control of government and put white men of rectitude and honor back into power. All right. That's what we were taught growing up, what my parents were taught, my, my grandparents. Uh, we have since learned uh, that things were not quite that way, that that legend was exaggerated because uh, Southern whites needed to believe that. They needed to believe that primarily because of the things that they did to overthrow the radical Republicans, as they call them, uh, who were in power. And uh, in 1874, uh, there was a very critical election in Alabama in which the Democrats decided that they were going to overthrow uh, what they called this black and tan coalition, uh, which controlled Alabama, and they were going to do whatever was necessary uh, to win. On election day down in Ufall, Alabama, uh, there was an incredible amount of violence. White people got themselves up in the second floor uh, uh, windows of uh, stores up and down the street of Eufaula, and when black people who were trying to vote came down the street, they fired a hail of bullets down on them. One black man who uh, uh, was trying to vote uh, was hit five times. He tried to get into a well so he could get out of the way, and he was hit five times with bullets before he could get down uh, into the well. Uh, this was an indication of how whites were determined that they were going to take control and they were going to do uh, even killing people. Uh, later that day, future Governor Braxton Bragg Comer and his brothers uh, went to a store um, at a place just outside Eufaula uh, where they uh, participated in shooting and killing uh, a white Republican uh, ballot counter. Uh, and Needless to say, very few ballots were counted in the 1874 election uh, for the Republicans uh, in Barber County. And throughout Alabama, there were incidents of violence, of vote stealing, uh, as whites were determined that they were going to take state government back from this biracial coalition in the Republican Party uh, that controlled the state. Uh, needless to say, the whites won. Uh, they took control of state government. Uh, now, why did they want to win so badly? Now, well, there's a very short answer to that. And the short answer to that is uh, they wanted to restore what they called white supremacy. Uh, but uh, that was not entirely what the, uh, that sounds like a, a simple prejudice and bigotry uh, involved there. Uh, it was much more than that. What these whites wanted to do, but more than anything else, was they wanted to control state government so that they could control the labor system in the state of Alabama. Uh, and who was most of the labor in the state of Alabama? Black people. Uh, and they were fearful that if the Republican Party stayed in power, that they would never be able to gain control of labor again in the state, or that they would eventually lose control of it because of laws that might be passed by the Republican Party. They also wanted control of the taxation system. Uh, they wanted taxes to be low on uh, particularly the big landowners in the Black Belt, uh, who were the leaders of the Democratic Party in Alabama in the 1870s, wanted taxes kept low because they feared uh, that uh, taxes would constantly be jacked up on them uh, to pay for things for black people. And so control of labor was central to controlling black people. Uh, and it was central to white supremacy. Uh, and controlling state government meant that laws dealing with the contracts, with master-servant relationships of all kinds, uh, with debts, and so on, uh, it meant that the Democrats could control those things. So they wanted control back. And the people who came to power then under the Democratic Party, we've come to call bourbons. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that term. Uh, there's another term. Uh, uh, they said that they had redeemed the state 
from what they call black Republican rule, and some people have called them redeemers. But nevertheless, whites throughout Alabama agreed to go along with this, not just black belt whites, but whites throughout the state, uh, the great, great majority of them, even North Alabama whites, who often in the past had disagreed with South Alabama whites in politics, joined together uh, to help restore white supremacy. Uh, the North Alabama whites were particularly upset at some of the taxes that had been passed during uh, the Reconstruction region. So what kind of government did the Bourbons restore in Alabama? Or what did they do when they got into power? Well, for one thing, they decided that they were going to be precisely the opposite of what they claimed the Republicans had been. And so what they did was create a government in which they severely limited the ability of the state to spend money, and thus severely limited uh, the uh, power of the state uh, to, to tax. George Smith Houston uh, was the uh, uh, governor of Alabama uh, uh, in the late 1870s, and he was the first governor to come in uh, with this program of lowering taxes, lowering spending, uh, and they even wrote uh, provisions into the new constitution they adopted in 1875, severely restricting the ability of the state to spend money uh, and to raise taxes. Now what does this mean when you create a government that can't tax and spend? That means that there are no public services. And so what the Bourbon administrations did was starve the state's public services. Uh, they practically closed the state's uh, education uh, system down. Uh, what little public education they had in Alabama, and then uh, the radical Republican administration had begun to try to fund education in the state. But the Bourbons stripped out much of this money. Uh, and so generation after generation of Alabamians after the 19th century uh, were severely damaged uh, by the Bourbon administration's uh, parsimonious attitude uh, toward uh, spending uh, for education. So there were anti-tax, anti-spending, and they were anti-black. And they pulled public services back to almost a starvation uh, level. They had claimed that the radical Republicans were corrupt. And there had been some radical Republicans who were corrupt. But the truth is, the radical Republicans were no more corrupt than the Bourbons which followed them. Governor O'Neill, Governor Edward O'Neill, who was one of the Bourbon governors, uh, showed up at the state capitol one day in 1883, uh, and um, somebody came to him and said, uh, uh, there's no money or very little money in the state treasury. We can't pay any bills. He said, what happened to it? And they said, well, the state treasurer had been gambling with the state's money. These are the honorable, honest white folks now who've come back into power after Reconstruction. And the state treasurer, who interestingly enough, was known as Honest Ike Vincent, <laughs> uh, had absconded with a substantial amount of money, thrown a great deal of it away, uh, and had taken off for Mexico before Governor O'Neill could locate him. Uh, and so he was indicted in his absence. Uh, he came back later and he decided he couldn't take it down to Mexico. Came back to Alabama and served a, a few years in the state penitentiary. Uh, and Governor Thomas Goode Jones, another bourbon governor, then gave him a full pardon. So much for the honest, honorable white man who took over the state of Alabama after Reconstruction, you see. So state government was probably no more honest, no more competent, and no more better run after Reconstruction than it was during Reconstruction. So the tragic legend of Reconstruction, we were all told, has been far overdone. Also, the North Alabama whites who had gotten together with uh, these Bourbon Democrats and had helped throw the radical Republicans out, decided by the, many of them, not all of them by any stretch, but a large portion of them decided by the 1880s that the Bourbon administration wasn't going to do anything for average people uh, in the state of Alabama. Uh, and they began to break with and dissent from the Democratic Party. Many of them began to run for office as independents. Uh, some ran for office as greenbackers. Uh, uh, they wanted to reform the currency system. 
Uh, and they believed that small farmers, little people in Alabama, were not getting anything out of these Berman administrations. Uh, and they wanted to reform state government. Um, the, uh, the Bourbons fought them, attempted to keep them out of power, uh, and the Bourbons were generally successful. But North Alabamians did elect a large number of independents and greenbackers to uh, state legislature. Uh, they even elected a greenbacker congressman from uh, uh, up in Huntsville, a man named William Manning Lowe. And these were people who were all deeply resentful of the Democratic Party and the Bourbons who ran it uh, in the late 19th century. Well, how did they run the Democratic Party? How did they control it? Um, and how did they run the state? Somebody said that they had control of state government uh, hand and foot. Uh, not only were they in power, but it was very difficult to dislodge them. If you wanted to dislodge them, you had to get elected to office as a Democrat. Nobody was going to be elected to statewide office as a Republican in the state of Alabama after Reconstruction because the Republican Party was considered to be the party of blacks. Uh, and so you had to somehow win the Democratic nomination. Well, people were not nominated in primaries in the late 19th century as they are now. You were nominated in conventions. And they held conventions in each county to select delegates to the state convention, and they held conventions to select candidates the state legislature. And the bourbon-controlled Democratic Party figured out a way to control all these conventions so that the right kind of people got nominated, figured out ways to control the state conventions so that the right kind of people got nominated, the right kind of people meaning their kind of people who thought like they did. Uh, and so the dissenters uh, could not win a place at the table uh, in the 1880s, early 1890s. Uh, the, uh, the Bourbon-controlled Democratic Party uh, kept them out. Now, this led to growing anger and resentment, particularly in northern Alabama, particularly in the hill country up there, and also in other parts of Alabama. Uh, by the 1890s, a, the Bourbons had created a kind of a political coalition, too. Uh, not only were the Black Belt planners firmly uh, ensconced in the bourbon wing of the Democratic Party in Alabama. Uh, but uh, by the 1890s, uh, many corporate leaders, big business leaders uh, uh, from the growing city of Birmingham, from other places, uh, had joined forces with the Black Belt planners. Now, they disagreed on some things, uh, but one thing they agreed on. The thing that they agreed on, well, they agreed on several things. They certainly agreed on low taxes, on land, and on property of all kinds, and they agreed on white supremacy. But these big businessmen who ran the coal mines uh, and were involved in the railroad business also agreed with the Black Belt planners on what else? The control of the labor supply in the state of Alabama, keeping it under firm control of the state's uh, planters, businessmen, uh, making sure that there was a huge supply of labor, a huge supply of cheap labor. So, and so the Bourbons, uh, from 1874 to the 1890s, had had things pretty much their own way, with the exception of a few revolts that I mentioned from these independents and greenbackers. Then a political movement began in the 1890s that scared the Bourbons to death. And this was the populist uh, rebellion of the 1890s. Farmers throughout Alabama and indeed throughout the South and the rest of the country were suffering uh, badly from uh, an economic downturn that had been going on really since the 1870s. The price of farm commodities all over the country was falling at a rapid rate. The price of cotton had fallen from 32 cents a pound in the 1860s to about 6 cents a pound uh, by the 1890s. And farmers all over Alabama were suffering. They couldn't pay their bills. They'd fallen deeply into debt. And they were getting no help from the national government or the state government. And so many of them began to join farmers' organizations like the Farmers' Alliance. Uh, and the Farmers' Alliance and some of these other farm organizations began to push farmers to get into politics. Uh, and in Alabama, I think there were about 125,000 uh, white farmers who joined the Farmers' Alliance uh, in the early 1890s. The populist revolt then was driven in large part by economic concerns, but there was also 
the bourbon control of the state Democratic parties. Many of these same people who were angry about economic matters were also angry about the bourbon control of the state Democratic Party. And then, of course, there were regional things which helped drive this populist movement of the 1890s. North Alabama whites were sick and tired of the Black Belt running everything. They were sick and tired of folks from Wilcox County <laughs> having more power than people in northern Alabama and, uh, did, uh, and from Sumter County. I was looking at a friend of mine here from Wilcox County, and I'm from Sumter County, and we both grew up in the Black Belt. Uh, uh, and uh, I wanted to know that uh, my folks were just as guilty as hers. <laughs> uh, but uh, in any event, uh, economic, political, and regional concerns then kind of come together in the 1890s and create a kind of grassroots political movement. Uh, the Farmers Alliance decided to run a man named Reuben F. Cobb uh, for governor in uh, uh, the 1890s. Uh, and he ran against uh, uh, Thomas Goo Jones, who was, the, uh, demo, uh, who was seeking the Democratic nomination uh, in 1890. Uh, and the farmers thought that they had enough votes to win the nomination for Cobb. Uh, but the Bourbons counted them out at the State Democratic Convention, threw some of their delegations out, and gave the nomination to Montgomery's Thomas Goode Jones. Uh, the farmers were very angry about this. Uh, and then in 1892, they decided, many of them, to form a third political party. Uh, rather than try to get the Democratic nomination, they said the Democratic Party is hopelessly controlled by these Bourbons hopelessly dominated by these black belt politicians. And so we are going to form another party. We're, just, we're still Democrats. We're going to call this the Jeffersonian Democrats. We're going to run. Another group of somewhat more radical farmers said, well, let's just join this new political party they created up north called the Populist Party. Let's join it. Uh, finally, the Jeffersonian Democrats and the Populists got together and while they were sort of in different parties, they were sort of agreeing on the same thing, beat the Bourbon Democrats. And they formed an organization to, together and nominated Reuben Cobb for governor in 1892. And thus, probably the most, uh, one of the most uh, thrilling uh, gubernatorial races in Alabama history took place in 1892 between Cobb uh, and Thomas Goo Jones. Uh, most people who know what happened during that campaign uh, think that Reuben Cobb was elected governor of Alabama and that he probably was elected by a fairly wide margin. But down in the Black Belt, whites down there decided that they would vote black people for the Democratic Party. Now, the Democratic Party now was the self-proclaimed party of white supremacy. The 1890s. That's what they call themselves. And yet when the votes were counted in Sumter and Wilcox and Dallas and Montgomery and other black belt counties, guess who won? The party of white supremacy, even though black people were a majority in all those counties. Thomas Goo Jones got 85% of the vote in Dallas County. 85% of the vote. Now you tell me all those black people turned out to vote for the party of white supremacy? The white folks just voted them. They just took the ballots and cast the ballots the way they wanted. And they stole the election. I think it's fairly clear. They stole the election of 1892 from Reuben F. Cobb. Uh, and Thomas Goo Jones was in for another two-year term. He, he elected governors every two years back then, the way the system was set up. And in 1894, they essentially practiced the same kind of politics and defeated the populist coalition another time. Now, why do they want to beat the populists so badly? The populists, or the Jeffersonian Democrats, depending on what you want to call them, called for black people to be allowed to vote freely, and even called for a kind of coalition to be put together between white farmers and blacks. Now, this must have really scared the Burpins, because if that had happened, they would have and, and if everybody had been able to vote freely in the state of Alabama, the Bourbons would really have had very little chance. Yet they won again. And there was even talk in 1894 
about people getting their guns and coming to Montgomery and throwing the Democrats out because they were illegally in power. Indeed, they marched up uh, the avenue out here in the state capitol on the day that uh, uh, the Bourbons inaugurated the new governor, William C. Oates, in 1894. And the state militia met a bunch of them up here at Goat Hill and uh, pushed them down. And they went over to a side street and they put Reuben F. Cobb up in a wagon and raised his hand and swore him in as governor of Alabama. Of course, he wasn't the governor because, to quote a, uh, a guy who I don't necessarily agree with very much, power often comes out of the barrel of a gun. And power in this instance came out of too many guns uh, uh, being uh, up on Capitol Hill. Uh, so what happened to the populist movement? It sort of went into decline after that. People began to say, well, we can't win. There's nothing we can do. The Democrats run everything. They steal the elections. Uh, uh, so what are we going to do? Then a guy came along named uh, Joseph Forney Johnston. Uh, and this is his picture. And Johnston uh, claimed to be a reformer. And he sort of ran as a reformer and said he wanted to do some of the things that the populists had wanted to do. And a lot of populists decided to support him. Uh, Jones was not really much of a reformer. I mean, Johnston was not really much of a, a, a reformer. Uh, he just wanted to win, uh, I think, more than anything else. Uh, but uh, uh, he managed to win the Democratic nomination uh, in 1896. Uh, and a lot of populists uh, uh, backed him. Uh, and so he helped to undermine the populist cause uh, by claiming to be a reformer, by attacking what he called the machine that had controlled the state. Uh, uh, that sounded very populistic and very reformist to, uh, to many people. Uh, and so Johnston is elected governor. And the populist party continues to decline after that nationally and in Alabama. However, the ideas and the motivations of that party uh, lived on uh, after the 1890s. Um, and people in North Alabama were still angry. Uh, people up in Coleman County and, and um, Franklin County and other places believed that politics in Alabama was extremely corrupt. Many of them who had been populist decided, decided to become Republicans. They decided to join the Republican Party, even though, even though they were whites. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the Bourbons uh, and their friends who were in power said, well, look, we're tired of these revolts. We're tired of these populists and these independents and these greenbackers. Let's make sure that these revolts don't occur anymore. Uh, and let's make sure that there can't be a kind of biracial coalition that we've been worried about so long. We're tired of stealing votes. They literally said, we're tired of stealing votes. <laughs> Future governor of Alabama, William Dorsey Jelks, told the State Democratic Executive Committee, you know, I really would like to get on the right side of the Lord this time. Let's don't steal the votes. Let's just take them away from the black people. If we take them away from them, if we take them away from them, they said this openly. This was openly they said this. If we take the votes away from them, they won't have to steal them anymore. So let's hold a constitutional convention and write a new constitution and take the votes away from them. And there'll be no more vote stealing. Right. And so that's what they did. 1901, they pushed to write a new constitution. John B. Knox, uh, who was also a uh, major corporate lawyer from uh, uh, Birmingham, chaired this convention. It was dominated then by what you'd call the, the, the Black Belt Big Mule Coalition, the big mules being the Birmingham uh, industrialists and, and mobile businessmen and their lawyers, uh, and they controlled uh, the convention. And they adopted a constitution which, in effect, wiped out uh, about 40% of the state's electorate. Right. Large numbers of black people, because practically all black people were wiped out, and large numbers of white people were wiped out. They adopted things like the poll tax, uh, and the literacy test, property qualifications, and so on. And there were a lot of poor white people, particularly in North Alabama, and this is who they were aiming it at, to a large extent, uh, who couldn't pay the poll tax, who couldn't, uh, who couldn't vote. Uh, and, uh, and so they ended up wiping out, as I said, 40% of the electorate, and they essentially killed off the Republican Party uh, in Alabama. 
There was no, no Republican Party uh, with any real power left in Alabama uh, for many, many years, really, until uh, un no Republican was elected to statewide office in Alabama from the end of Reconstruction to 1980. Uh, Jeremiah Denton would be the first uh, Republican to be elected to statewide office in Alabama uh, after, uh, after Reconstruction. Now, let's not confuse the modern Republican Party with the Republican Party of the late 19th century. Nevertheless, it's true that a one-party political system uh, was created uh, as a result of the disfranchisement measures adopted at the 1901 Constitutional Convention. And so politics uh, shifted in 1900 uh, it was a, a politics of white people only. Uh, and uh, throughout the country, after 1900, there was a movement called the Progressive Movement, which was a sort of general reform movement, which grew out of the problems that had been created by uh, growing industrialization and urbanization in this country. There are all kinds of problems about labor and, and uh, how to control giant corporations that were growing up. Um, child labor, that sort of thing. Uh, and about regulating the railroads, which had become uh, really the sole means, the sole uh, major means of transportation in the country. Uh, and so progressives generally supported all sorts of reforms to regulate corporations, big business, the railroads, uh, and uh, there were conservatives which opposed that kind of thing. All progressives did not support all progressive reform. Some supported some and disagreed with others. The central figure in Alabama's progressive movement was Governor Braxton Bragg Comer, a man I mentioned earlier who had gone with his brothers as a very young man to take over that polling place in Barber County back in 1874. Comer was an extremely wealthy businessman who had grown wealth, uh, wealthy first in the grocery business and then had become a textile manufacturer. And he had gotten very angry with the railroads because the railroads in, uh, in Alabama were charging him what he called, uh, what he believed to be excessive rates to ship his products. He believed that Alabama businessmen uh, were not being given a fair shake uh, and that businessmen in surrounding states were out competing us uh, as a result of that. And so Comer wanted to create a state railroad commission uh, to regulate the railroads. And he made that the main part of his platform. He, got a, he eventually got elected to the State Railroad Commission. There was a railroad commission. What he wanted to do was to give it greater powers. I'm sorry, I misstated that. He wanted to give it greater power. He was elected to the Railroad Commission in 1904 and was unable to achieve the sorts of things he wanted to achieve on that commission, and so he decided to run for governor uh, uh, in 1906. Uh, and he became the issue in that race. Uh, he and railroad regulation and prohibition. Most progressives were prohibitions. And the issue of prohibition uh, became really one of the two or three major issues in Alabama politics uh, uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, there was almost every governor's race, there was a guy who wanted the state to be dry, and there was somebody who wanted what they called local option, in other words, to let the counties choose for themselves whether or not they wanted to be wet uh, or dry. Well, B.B. Comer was a dry, and he wanted to regulate the railroads, and he also, though, wanted to do something to help increasing funding for education in the state. He got elected in 1906, and a running battle then occurred between him and the conservative forces, uh, and particularly the, the dry, excuse me, between him and the wet forces in the, the state legislature. Uh, Comer even tried to put prohibition in the state constitution. Um, just making the state dry wasn't enough. He wanted to keep it dry forever. Uh, he failed to put it in the state constitution. And, uh, he, he lost that. Uh, but uh, he did make the state more dry than it had ever been before. Uh, he did uh, increase the power of the Railroad Commission. Uh, and uh, increased power over uh, the railroads. And he did do a lot to fund education. He created a lot of public high schools all over Alabama. Some of those high schools still stand that the Comer administration uh, built. 
So Carmel becomes a major issue, and the corporate establishment in Alabama, the, uh, most of the big businessmen, don't like him. They want to defeat him. Now, he's out for one term, and in 1914 he ran again. Up until then, the state did not have runoffs in their Democratic primaries. Uh, they had created a primary system uh, uh, early in the 20th century. Uh, and they thought maybe if they could get him into a runoff, they would beat him. Uh, before uh, 1914, if you got a plurality of the votes, you were elected. So they forced Comer into a runoff in 1914, even though he ran in first place, and they defeated him. Uh, and so state government was, after uh, for the next four years, dominated pretty much by conservative forces. Uh, let me stop just a moment and talk a little bit about Washington. We haven't said much about politics in Washington. Uh, I hope I don't run out of time here. Uh, Alabama's uh, United States senators, frankly, have not accomplished very much for this state uh, in the years of, uh, before uh, the night for the 20th century, and uh, uh, really the first senator who began to achieve uh, major things in Washington was John H. Bankhead Sr. Uh, uh, and, and Bankhead, um, uh, excuse me, Debbie, I know we passed by Booker T. Washington. I'm going to talk about Booker T. Washington in just a second. Uh, Bankhead uh, helped push through uh, one of the first major highway acts uh, in the United States. The automobile had, come, had become a major uh, thing in this country, and Bankhead pushed through a, a road act uh, that created uh, uh, major highways uh, for the first time, most of them being dirt roads, but nevertheless, uh, it, was a, it was a groundbreaking uh, law. And of course, the Bankhead family uh, became major figures in state politics. Senator Bankhead's son, William B. Bankhead, was elected to Congress uh, also. Alabama, uh, what happened to black people in politics? To go back to Booker T. Washington just uh, briefly. Well, there were no black people in politics uh, uh, for the most part because of the uh, uh, disfranchisement uh, provisions of the 1901 Constitution. And the Republican Party was dead. But when the Republican Party would win power in Washington, they could appoint people to federal judges, um, district attorneys, uh, customs collectors' positions and so on in Alabama. And Booker T. Washington had a great deal to do with who got appointed. Indeed, it was very difficult to get appointed in Alabama without his approval. So it wasn't that the black community had no power in, uh, in state politics. Certainly he did exercise some. One of B.B. Comer's good friends, Thomas E. Kilby, uh, was elected governor of Alabama uh, uh, in, uh, in 1918 in a very controversial race. Uh, Bib Graves, um, don't need to put him up yet, Debbie, but we'll, Bib Graves, uh, a young uh, Montgomery attorney, had been a great supporter of B.B. Of Comer, and he was mad about the runoff of 1914, and he got himself the uh, selected chairman of the State Democratic Executive Committee, and they created a new voting system in Alabama in 1914. How many of you know about that voting system? Uh, under this voting system, uh, you went down, and if there were, uh, you, you could vote for your first choice and your second choice. Uh, and the person who got the most first and second choice votes was the winner. So you could combine your first and second choice. You didn't have to select a second choice. But, uh, of course, those votes counted. And Graves thought that this was a way to get around this runoff system that the conservatives had, uh, had created. Thomas E. Kilby, one of Comer's friends, then ran in 1918 uh, and managed to, uh, to win the governorship. Uh, uh, Kilby was what you might call sort of business progressive. He proved to be a very able governor. Uh, he was uh, a man who uh, put into place some uh, laws regulating corporations uh, and some minor tax reforms uh, uh, in the state and also uh, helped in building roads and so on. So Kilby was uh, a pretty good governor, uh, and that's really hitting his administration with very high, just the high spots, uh, and proved to be a very efficient uh, uh, governor. 
but he was still what you might call a business progressive. Uh, he had supporters who were conservatives and some supporters who were progressives in the order of B.B. Coma. But labor in Alabama felt that it was always left out no matter who the governor of the state was. That either neither the business progressives like Comer or Kilby, uh, nor uh, anyone, certainly the conservatives, didn't do anything for the cause uh, of labor. And so in the 1920s, the Alabama Democratic Party really divides, I think, into three factions. Um, and there was a political race in the 1920s, uh, which we'll come back to in just a second, which demonstrated that. Those three factions were the business progressives. These were people who supported building roads, spending a lot of government money uh, to facilitate the business interests and, and other people. In other words, let's modernize the state. Uh, and then there were the conservatives, which, who opposed a lot of this spending. Uh, and then there was a third group now. And these were people who used to support the business progressives. But this third group also was very pro-labor. Uh, and they were the more radical wing of the Democratic Party. Bib Graves uh, was really part of this wing of the party. Uh, and he was uh, joined in that uh, uh, by a guy named Cotton Tom Heflin, Hal Heflin's uncle. Uh, and uh, my favorite name in Alabama politics, a politician from Jasper, Alabama, whose name was Lycurgus Breckenridge Musgrove. Uh, and Breck Musgrove and Tom Heflin and Bib Graves and later on Hugo Black were all members of this uh, uh, sort of much more radical progressive wing uh, of the party. Uh, and organized labor supported them and they supported labor. Uh, and in 1920, uh, they tried to defeat uh, Alabama Senator Oscar W. Underwood. Uh, Underwood was a sort of conservative, uh, and Breck Musgrove ran against him for the United States Senate. And you could see these three factions operating in that 1920 race where Oscar W. Underwood was concerned. Uh, people like Musgrove and Graves and those people uh, uh, were opposed to Underwood. Uh, but the conservatives and the business progressives supported Oscar Underwood. Um, Thomas E. Kelby. Uh, and uh, supported Underwood. Uh, and so uh, Underwood won, but by the skin of his teeth. And it sent a signal that there was a real war on Alabama politics in the 1920s. Then this more radical faction of the party got some help. Where'd they get the help from? They decided to make a kind of Faustian bargain. There was a, a new and revived Ku Klux Klan uh, that uh, had grown up in Alabama in the 20s uh, for a variety of reasons. Indeed, the Ku Klux Klan was a national organization. There were really more uh, uh, folks in the Ku Klux Klan up north than there were down south. Uh, but in Alabama, the organization spread pretty quickly across the state. And people like Bib Graves and Hugo Black and Breck Musgrove and Cotton Tom Heflin quickly uh, saw the Klan as a way to throw the Bourbon Democrats out for good, to get rid of them. Uh, to defeat that wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, and uh, indeed, Bib Graves wrote his old friend, B.B. Uh, Comer, and said, I'm running, I'm going to run for governor. And B.B. Comer said, I'd like to support you, but you're too close to organized labor and the Ku Klux Klan. And I can't support you for that reason. Of course, this is the same guy who walked in with a gun into that polling place in 1874. Uh, but uh, in, in any event, uh, one of the most, another one of the most famous political races in Alabama occurred in 1926. Bib Graves sought the governorship. Uh, Hugo Black sought the election to the United States Senate. And they got the endorsement of the Ku Klux Klan, in addition to the endorsement of labor unions, teachers' organizations, and uh, women's suffrage organizations. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, the votes of women uh, had become extremely important uh, uh, in Alabama, they, women hadn't voted prior to 1920. And so these organizations that women were prominent in, like the Anti-Saloon League, which is prohibitionist, and many of them supported Bib Graves uh, uh, for governor, uh, and large numbers of them supported Hugo Black. 
Uh, and so they put together this coalition and they, uh, and they won uh, by very narrow margins, but Bib Graves was elected governor and Hugo Black was elected to the United States Senate. And Bib Graves then was the first pro-labor, pro-union governor that the state of Alabama really had ever had. And this meant a great deal uh, to the unions. Both he was elected governor, of course, later in the 1930s again, uh, and demonstrated his uh, support for organized labor uh, during both of the times uh, that he was in office. Uh, and so the Ku Klux Klan played a major role in Alabama politics in the 1920s. And it's unquestionably true that Graves and Black could not have been elected without Klan support. Well, I got about three minutes uh, here. Uh, but uh, don't get confused, the Ku Klux Klan could not have by itself elected anybody to public office in Alabama in the 1920s. There weren't uh, enough of them and there wasn't enough agreement among them to have elected anybody. It's a great myth uh, that the Ku Klux Klan controlled Alabama politics in this time. Um, uh, they, but Graves and Black could not have been elected had they not had Klan support. So the Klan was an integral part of the coalition that they put together uh, to win uh, in the 20s. Uh, the 1920s politics in Alabama will really sort of end up with another sort of famous campaign in 1928 uh, in the presidential election of that year. Alabama almost went Republican in 1928. And why did that happen? Because the Democrats nominated Alfred E. Smith for president. And Smith was what, a Catholic and a wet. Uh, and the dry uh, Protestant forces of Alabama were very upset. And a lot of people voted Republican in the 1928 presidential race. Indeed, the Republicans came within 7,000 votes of winning Alabama uh, in 1928. And one of the people who got out and attacked Al Smith all over Alabama, although he would never say he was going to vote Republican, was Cotton Tom Heflin. And Tom Heflin said, uh, I swear I'll never vote for Al Smith. I'll not vote for him. And he went all over Alabama attacking Al Smith. And what happened after that, of course, was that the State Democratic Executive Committee met the next year, and when Tom Heflin uh, came up for re-election, they wouldn't let him run the Democratic primary because he had support because they said he had supported the Republicans. He said, "I never voted Republican." Uh, and they kicked him off the ticket and ruined his political career. Uh, he was never elected to uh, the public office again uh, after that. Uh, that about sums up Alabama politics from 1874 to 1929. I'll take some questions. Right. That was just hitting the high spots. <laughs> um, if you have questions, please raise your hand and we will get a microphone to you and speak directly into the microphone because we do have people in the next auditorium that would like to hear you. Questions? This <laughs> fellow back here in the blue shirt. Yeah. In, my name is Robert Cope. In talking about the earlier history of the South, and I frequently look at the history of the South and, and, and look at what I could look at the mind of the South today. And I was I would ask of you to uh, contribute uh, your thoughts as to how that history uh, of those days plays into the Alabama political mindset today? Well, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, so let me just quote William Faulkner. Um, uh, the past is not dead, it's not even past. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, beyond that, I really don't want to say. Uh, uh, I'll be. <laughs> I, yeah. I believe the next governor, Governor Miller, won without the Klan. Yes, Governor Miller was elected in 1930. He denounced the Ku Klux Klan. 
Uh, and indeed, the Klan was sort of in tatters by 1930 anyway. And, and of course, he, he used that as a great rallying cry uh, to bring certain forces together uh, behind him. Uh, Bill Miller was actually a good governor. Uh, he, he got elected governor in a bad time uh, when the state didn't have any money. And he did his best to try to get the state to adopt an income tax and, and, and uh, had a great fight with the legislature. I spoke about that down here one time at, uh, uh, at archives. Uh, and it uh, showed a lot of uh, courage uh, uh, in the process of that. Anybody else? Uh, my, my first job out of college was with Senator John Sparkman, and when we were cleaning out his uh, attic, I found uh, his master's thesis paper, which he wrote about the Cobbs Oats race. Right. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more. I noticed you mentioned it, but. Uh, well, of course, Thomas Goode Jones beat uh, Cobb in uh, 1890 and 1892, and then uh, William C. Oates, uh, veteran of uh, the great uh, Battle of Gettysburg, uh, uh, who had led the Confederates up the hill, I guess, at uh, Seminary Ridge, uh, uh, was elected, uh, defeated Cobb in, uh, in 1894. Uh, and John Sparkman did do a master's thesis on that at, uh, at, at the University of Alabama. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I worked for John Sparkman, too. Uh, in, in 1972. Um, but, uh, yeah, that race was a lot like the, the one of 1892. Uh, the Democrats screamed that, well, if you elect this third party, you're going to undermine white supremacy. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, if you don't, if you, if you don't elect the Democrats, you're going to undermine white supremacy. Your daughters will be marrying them. Oh, goodness. You know, and, and that, that was what they always said, you know, every time uh, it looked like the Democrats might, uh, might lose. Uh, and, and the 94 race, the 1894 race was, was a lot like that, and there was a lot of vote stealing going on in, in all those races, 1992 and, uh, and 94. Um, I don't really know what else to say about them except that. Uh, and there was a lot more to say about populism. Populism. Uh, uh, had the political races been honest, uh, just from my point of view, was probably the most hopeful political movement in Alabama's history because it, it gave the promise of becoming a biracial political movement. And, uh, and that would have, how would that have changed Alabama? Would have changed it for generations and generations uh, if, that had been, if that had taken place. They were actually, meeting together with black people, uh, the populist were, uh, uh, in, in the 1890s, and, and, and realizing that working people, small farmers, could not accomplish what they needed to accomplish if they were going to be separated by race. And that the old trick in Southern politics, the old trick had always been and would be after the 1890s to separate whites and blacks. If you can separate them, you can do what? You can control them. You can control the labor system. And then those who are wealthy, those who are well off, those who want huge supply of cheap labor uh, can continue to control state government, control all the laws, control the economy. Now, whenever I say that, there's always somebody that says, you sound like a communist. I had this student who read my book, Two Party Politics and One Party South. I didn't hear this, but she said that in the seminar of one of my colleagues at UAB, this man's a Marxist. <laughs> she said, well, anybody who knows anything about Marxism and has read my book knows that I'm precisely the opposite of that. But, but nevertheless, uh, uh, I think we, we uh, make a mistake. Now, shut up after this. It's in part an answer to your question. We make a mistake when we underrate the power of money in politics. And when you hear all this stuff today, it's going on on television, it's on, about how terrible Barack Obama is, how terrible what he's trying to do is. Always understand that the power of money is involved. It's all about who's going to pay the taxes, who's going to get the rewards, and it's not about 
prayer in the schools and all of that. Those are secondary things. Uh, it's big money versus people who want to take the power of big money away from is is one of the is, is the great fight uh, and